The mission of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition is to ensure that children with inattentive ADHD are diagnosed by the age of 8 and that adults with inattentive ADHD receive prompt and accurate diagnosis when seeking help. To learn more about our mission and how you can help, visit iadhd.org. Hello, I'm Katherine Ellison. I'm a journalist and author of several books, including the ADHD family memoir, Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention. I'm here with Angie Mack today, who is a performer and global artist. Angie, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are? Sure. My name is Angie Mack, and I've primarily been involved in the performing arts for most of my life. I do a lot of things. I've written a book called Chronic Creativity. It's an online book. I'm the founder of an arts business called Ozaki Talent. I mentor youth and I produce musicals. I perform. I do drum circles in the community. Last night I was performing with some musicians. I write. I'm a poet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's just pretty much everything creative. Yeah. Yeah. Have you always been Damn. so multifaceted or is this something that's been new in your life? No, I've always been multifaceted. I've always enjoyed the arts. I gravitated towards the arts as a child and would even put on musicals and plays for the neighborhood kids. Now that I look back, it was the multisensory dopamine fix, right. you know, that it gave me. It's now wonderful. I understand. Now I understand. Yeah. I want to get into that, but where did you grow up and where are you now? I grew up in about a hundred miles outside of Chicago in what's known as the hardware capital of the world. It was a steel factory town and it was a working class town. It was bilingual. So I had to learn Spanish when I was in kindergarten. I was in the minority in my neighborhood. A very diverse group of kids that I grew up with. I really enjoyed that because I got to learn about other cultures and how they did things in their families. And right now, I live in Wisconsin. Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. So I understand recently we're diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. Yes, just about three years ago. Mm -hmm. At age what? Well, I don't like to give my age oh my because <laughs> I'm in the performing arts. Okay. But let's just say I have three grown boys. Okay. And I have grandchildren. Um, so um, being diagnosed as a grandmother. Wow. Yeah. 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 I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> yeah. Or else you had children like at 13 or something, right? Yeah. So, Angie, why did it take so long for you to be diagnosed, do you think? I did try to get help. I did try to go to different places and therapists and doctors and try to get evaluated. Over the years, I was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, which as I'm learning is quite common for girls with ADD. Mm -hmm. And I was treating it as if it was that. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until I found out that I had the ADD and started taking medication for that, that I don't, my meds have changed as far as antidepressant. The anxiety is a lot less. And I'm realizing that a lot of that anxiety had to do with just all of the swirling thoughts that were in my head, just the inability to zero in on one thought at times. Aside from swirling thoughts, when you think back to your childhood, do you feel you can identify some ADHD symptoms? Absolutely. Some of the early signs, and again, I'm not an expert at all because I just learned about myself three years ago, but as a child, I had an intense quest to learn. I was always asking why. In kindergarten, we had a woodworking station and I was more interested in building alone in the corner than 
socializing and playing house, what the other girls were doing. I had this early curiosity, always asking why. Socializing wasn't as fun for me. I would rather learn, and I'm still like that to this day. I read a lot. I research a lot. I write a lot more than social functions. Do you think um, that, that social issue or challenge is part of having ADHD for some reason? And why? I think it is because for so long I was ostracized or made fun of because I was different. How did people make fun of you? What kind of different were you? I have a little poem that I wrote. You can stop me, but if I can read it, it explains it. Sure. Okay. It's called Two. I changed my mind too much. A different crush, a different day. Kiss em, ditch em, showing off. They called it showing off. Showing off in front of the boys. Angie, quit showing off. Come to think of it, I was just happy and my happy was loud. I could hyper-focus on stage and quickly find words and pitch a strike, pitch a story, do a straight cartwheel and fly through the air, tweet like a bird the highest. Now that was showing off. Accused of trying too hard, thinking too little, too obnoxious, too allowed, too expressive, too weird. Lonely, lonely, lonely. Never understanding, too messy. Too many questions, staring too long. But how could I change? Why did I have to change? What was wrong with asking questions? What was wrong with staring too long? Always confused. I tried to be funny and apparently it was wrong. I didn't know that it was wrong. How come it's wrong? I didn't know how to converse and so I tried to be funny, but my funny was wrong. And so now I play the song, but the song doesn't give me money. So I teach to eat. And what do I teach? How to be too loud, how to be too expressive, how to perform on a stage. And it isn't wrong. And it isn't weird. And it isn't show-offish. And it isn't too much. I love that. I think that concept of two just so captures what a lot of girls in particular get as, yeah. right? Too loud, too, just not, no, too much. I got that. I got that a lot from my parents. Did you feel like you got yes. from your parents as well? Yes, because I was constantly asking questions. I had a very high energy level. I was a lot more physically hyper than I am now, although I still do a lot of physical intentional activity on a daily basis to this day. But I would get accused of having my head, head in the clouds, being a space cadet, not paying attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Did you have siblings? Did, yes. yes. How many? Three siblings, yes. Were they older, younger? I had a sibling who was older than me that did not grow up in the home. Uh -huh. She was physically handicapped and mentally handicapped. I had a younger brother, four years younger, and a younger sister, eight years younger. They loved my energy. They loved it. My role in the home was to entertain. Uh huh. That, I was the entertainer in the home growing up. Did you feel like your parents were just too stressed or too busy to deal with all your energy? Or? There were complicated issues inside of the home that I would consider somewhat separate. I had a lot of trauma in my home growing up for a variety of reasons. Sometimes? Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes that's a function of ADHD and the genes. Maybe one or both parents had an, uh, mental, emotional issues they were struggling with, but not diagnosed. Yeah, it was a complicated, it was complicated childhood. Yeah, yeah. So I spent a lot of time alone. 
there wasn't a lot of communication in my family about feelings. It gave me a lot of time to explore my curiosity and become very independent at a young age. That was mm-hmm. positive, but it sounds like you were coping with anxiety and depression for quite a while. When did you first suspect that ADHD might be involved? I've always known that my brain worked differently. About 20 years ago, I really didn't explore the ADD option because I think I had stigmas about ADHD, that it was just hyperactivity. I kind of self-diagnosed myself with something that I called chronic creativity. Okay. I wrote and I thought, okay, nobody knows what's the matter with me. I know there's something wrong with me. I thought, okay, let's write about this. The first thing I said was the purity, the medical purity on different quirks and traits that I have. For example, I said that I have claustrophobia. Now, now not literal claustrophobia, but I used it in a way to explain that I'm always looking for new ideas or new patterns, new ways of doing things. Another symptom that I diagnosed, again, it's a parody, was in other words, always trying to solve problems. I'm really good at hacks. What I'm really great at it is reframing things that are challenges into yes. such positive things. So you a wonderful teacher with the kids. Or are you teach kids? Yeah, I teach all ages. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. What do you teach? You teach art, music? Primarily the performing arts. Yeah. Producing and directing musicals, primarily in youth theater. I've worked with adults as well, but I also give private music lessons. I teach piano, guitar, drum. Oh my goodness. Voice, acting. <laughs> I think in music. I think in pictures. I think in words. I think in metaphors, but I do think a lot. (laughs) Too much sometimes. Yeah, too much. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, after you got diagnosed, what changed for you? I took the medication that my doctor had given me, and I was sitting on my front porch. And after about maybe 10 minutes, I looked up at the sky And I saw one cloud in the sky and I started to cry because the clarity of being able to focus on that one cloud made me cry. It was like a fog had been lifted. Wow. Since then, I became very productive. I was able to keep my routines. I was able to notice when there was more mess in my house, when I didn't have the medication, I didn't notice messes as much as I did with the medication. It's so interesting. Yeah, just what you notice and what you see. People talk about it like putting on glasses, so. Yeah, it was like that for sure. And yeah. Did you mention that you then stop taking other medications that you had been on? Or- I did, yeah. It was an experiment. Initially, I'd gone off the anxiety and depression medication, and that was good. That was good for a while. But I'm finding that there's still anxiety there. We're trying to address that as well. It's not as bad it, as it used to be. I've always struggled with severe social anxiety. And very bad. To, yeah. You can perform on a stage and not have terrible stage fright. Yes, I've heard it's a thing. Yeah, yeah I can get in front of audiences and play lead roles and talk. No problem. No, right. no stage fright. Yeah. No. But it's the social settings for a lot of reasons. For one of them, I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies. So I'm out of touch. 
And that's my choice. I would rather read, write, compose, play music. Well, that gets a lot to talk about, right? You don't always have to talk about the news or the latest program. I think it's really refreshing to hear about what you're writing and working on. Yeah, I've been trying to find groups of friends that are musicians that I can create more with. I had a really fun time last night. I played the congas on a friend's porch and we had a bunch of guitar players and drummers we never met before. This idea of coming together with a common purpose, that's really where I thrive. Coming together to put on a play, coming together to write a song, but coming together for anything else. Is this hard for me? I totally get it. I think there's a threshold for boredom. It's just hard to schmooze and make small talk sometimes. Uh Yeah. Yeah. But also Uh as a child, you were told or given the impression that you were strange. I think that might be a barrier to maybe worried about how people see you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. In all those years that you were not medicated for ADHD, did you come up with some good strategies for coping with it? I did. For the musicals, I developed a system where pretty much in my work life, everything that I have to organize is in a spreadsheet and in Google Calendar. Everything is in boxes. I have to check it often to stay on task. Movement has always been a healer for me. I've always been one to like some sort of exercise, whether it be when my kids were little, I used to have a little mini trampoline. We had an apartment and I had a little trampoline in the apartment. Looking back, now I understand why. I've always tried to be a part of a a health club or Something like that. Water is really healing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I have found ways to utilize my talents. I've done a lot of writing over the years. I particularly like to write poetry. Um, I like to write songs. And so you really express yourself just in the way that you're, I love what you're doing with your hair. (laughs) Yeah. Colors. Have you always done that or is that a new thing? My appearance fluctuates. It changes. Growing up, I had to wear polo shirts and khaki pants. As a child, I did not like dressing that way. (laughs) The collar was tight and the pants were tight. As an adult, when I could choose my clothes, I purposely gravitated towards clothes that were loose fitting, comfortable, colorful. I've been this way for most of my adult life. Yeah. There are some years where as soon as you got the chance, not so much, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah. I look back. Do you think that there were signs that a teacher of yours in grade school might have caught if they knew what to look for? Yeah, there were some early things. When I was in third grade, we had a a new Apple or Macintosh computer. And this is when computers first came out. The first ever computer in the school, I knocked over because I was running in the classroom. When I was in second grade, I would always touch the other kids. And I would have to twiddle my thumbs like this at the desk. The teacher would Uh, tell you to do that. Would tell me to twiddle my thumbs. Yeah, because I couldn't sit still. But Um, nobody suggested that there was something neurological going on or boys around you getting diagnosed with ADHD, but. Not where I was growing up. No, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody. That was diagnosed. Had you been diagnosed back then, how do you think your life would have been different? It almost makes me want to cry because 
it's affected every area of my life. Obviously, I don't want to talk about the difficult things. But you can talk a little bit. <laughs> it's so positive that it's a testament to you have overcome a lot, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have struggled in my relationships. Marital, I've been through two marriages now. A lot of it has to do with the courting process. There is much more impulsivity when I was younger. I have struggled with finances. I'm not good with finances. It's been a struggle. I've had a lot of, of medical conditions that are affiliated with ADHD. Things like, like insomnia, uh, upper respiratory infections, allergies, rhinitis, just overall inflammation. Right. Different addictions throughout my lifetime that have switched around. Struggles with food, obesity at times. Seeking that, forever seeking that dopamine has led me into situations that I don't know that I necessarily would have sought out had I been medicated. The shame, the chronic low self-esteem that I've carried with me, the victimization that happens. I've been a victim many times of several things. Because of what related to ADHD? Because of being distracted or? Yeah, I think maybe being distracted, being alone, not understanding, liking the shiny personalities. And sometimes shiny personalities aren't always the safest. I'm learning. That's such a good point. Yeah, yeah. It's like shiny. <laughs> And never thought of it that way. I think you're right. Yeah. Aside from medication, how are you treating your ADHD now? What are you learning to do? The, is the medication helping you financially? Unfortunately, the medication that was working for me for two years, there's a national shortage of. Uh, Adderall. So huh. in January, I was forced to go off a month. What did you do? <laughs> it was a struggle. It was a big struggle. I documented my journey through talking into my phone. I struggled a lot. I called into work. My motivation wasn't there. My self-esteem tanked. Wow. I was not able to keep my routine schedule, my sense of time got totally thrown off. I would stay at home for what I thought would be maybe an hour, and it would be four hours. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that you notice you could see the difference, right? Yeah. So, since February, have you been consistently okay with that? Yeah, I had to go on a different medication that does mm. not work as well. Mm. I would say that I'm still struggling. It's better, but I'm working with my doctor to try to get the right dosage. I've made it clear that I was totally stable for two years on the original medication. Really? Oh. I think that's where some of the anxiety is coming in too. Just having to switch meds, it's different. It's just different. We're working on possibly increasing the dosage next time around. Are you taking Adderall and now you're taking Ritalin or what's the... Now, now I'm taking Vyvanse. Vyvanse, I thought, was Adderall. That's interesting. Yeah. 
I think it does something slightly different. Again, I'm not an expert. I just know I was really stable. I felt very productive. I got a lot more done. Yeah. And yeah, it's been a struggle. It really has. So what I've been doing is bilateral movement in the water. I go to a health club that has water. Water it helps me a lot. Sitting in a hot tub, it just helps release stress. It touches different nerve parts of my body. Doing calisthenics in the water, yeah. breathing, stretching in the water, like somatic movement type things. I can't do an aerobics class where it's led by somebody else. Everything that I do in life is more is self directed. Yeah. I, I didn't make it into cheerleading or I wasn't a good dance class student because everything I do, I create. I read on your website that you've had a global impact. Can you talk about that? Yes. I live in a city that happened to have a piece of history that was quite covered. And that history was that they were early blues artists that recorded in my city, just a couple blocks from where I live. And long story short, it became my rabbit hole for many years. Topic of research. The music recorded in my city was basically the fundamentals of rock and roll music. Um, it influenced music worldwide. The music history was vast. I've connected with a lot of people, again, similar interests. So people interested in this type of music, which they're more interested around the world than they are lo locally. Yeah. I've worked with a writer from the Netherlands doing research work. There was a Russian author who came to interview me because they weren't allowed to study this type of music under communism. I'm in some books around the world, Japan. People will come to my city and want to know more of the history, people from around the world. And there really isn't anything here. They come to my house to learn about the blues. And is this what you're most proud of in your creative work or is there something that we haven't talked about? Yeah, it's been a global thing. Yes, it is because it also touches on something that is really entrenched in me and that is social justice. I've had to let go of a lot of it. I've had to set it down for a while, but I always seem to pick it back up. Mm -hmm. um, let me go sorry. back to the question. Mm -hmm that I didn't really follow through en uh, enough. When we're talking about how your teachers might have noticed, one was that you touched other kids a lot. Was there any other thing that you did that you think somebody who knew what to look for might have been a sign of ADHD? I would blurt out things out of turn. I... You were living up to your potential a lot. <laughs> I wasn't told that because mm. I had so much time alone at home. There was a spirit of grief in my family. I was home a lot. Studying was enjoyable. Uh -huh. Being good in school. I was a straight A student uh -huh. growing up. I enjoyed the attentions, the attention that the teachers gave me. Uh-huh. And that was my motivation for being a good student. And again, I enjoyed reading. I spent summers reading, playing outside, things like that. What are you reading now? Anything interesting? <laughs> what am I reading now? I've been reading a lot about twice exceptionalism. Uh -huh. I think that's you, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I've just discovered about that. So 
I've been reading about that. I typically don't like fiction. I like researching. I'm looking into things relating to trauma. I'm reading a lot about trauma. I'm reading about expressionism in the arts. I'm reading about bilateral movement. I've been intentionally doing that as my own therapy. I enjoy drumming a lot. I enjoy rhythm. So I do a lot with rhythm. Um, It sounds like you've really learned over the years how to take care of yourself, which is really a great, I mean, despite the temporary maybe difficulties, the the Mm -hmm. progression seems to be so positive. I think we've got to wrap up now, but I want to tell you just how much I've enjoyed talking with you and hope things improve. (laughs) It looks like you're making so much progress in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I answered all the questions. Sometimes I go on tangents. (laughs) I don't like to blurt out and interrupt you, but I think you said a lot of very interesting things. So thank you for that. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm looking forward to interviewing you on a future show. Here at the Inattentive ADHD Coalition, we're making a library of videos of interviews with people with inattentive ADHD as they talk about their challenges and their successes. If you would like to be interviewed, please send your contact information to www.iadhd.org forward slash awareness. This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD. Thank you.